Hello, everyone, and welcome to another conversation with Canadian jazz legends presented by TD Halifax Jazz Festival. My name is Charles Schwinn, and I am a board member of the TD Halifax Jazz Festival, as well as host of the Swing Arrangement on CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax, as well as Evening Solitude on 105.9 Seaside FM, the home of good music. And today, it is my honor and pleasure to interview the great Heather Banbrick. A Juno-nominated vocalist, Heather Banbrick prides herself on being the entertainer through and through. She's described as what happens when Shababa da da da, Ella Fitzgerald meets, <laughs> I'm so glad we had this time together, Carol Burnett, at a Newfoundland kitchen party. And she has collaborated with legendary artists, including Phil Nimmons, Fred Hirsch, Gene DeNovi, Guido Basso, Anne Hampton Calloway, Carol Wellsman, Jackie Richardson, Ian Shaw, as well as the late Rob McConnell and Peter Appleyard. Her solo recordings have each received an East Coast Music Award nominations for Jazz Recording of the Year, and her 27 release, You Will Never Know, was also nominated for a Juno Award for Vocal Jazz Album of the Year. And she is also an award-winning broadcaster, which I hear every single morning, hosting and producing shows on Jazz.fm91 in Toronto, as well as most recently as the founder of Jazzcast, a 24-hour internet-based uh, jazz station out of Toronto. And as well, she is currently the host of Jazzology and the aptly named Heather Brandrick Show. And Heather was runner-up for Best Radio Personality in Now Magazine's Best of Toronto Readers Poll. That's the coast here in Halifax equivalent as well as three-time nominee and two-time winner for Broadcaster of the Year at the National Jazz Awards, and deservedly so. In 2019, Heather came to St. Paul's Church, just around the corner from here, uh, to the very last live TD Halifax Jazz Festival, debuting her then new album, Fine State. Welcome, Heather Banbrick, to Halifax again, virtually. Oh, Charles. <laughs> I wish I was there in person. I'm actually, it's funny, I'm, I'm looking at a lake kind of in front of me because I'm at my in-laws cottage right now so seeing you and and seeing the view behind you and seeing the water kind of ahead I can pretend yes you know coast not to mid coast <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's not the ocean but it's close how so you doing how, my friend how are you I'm I'm okay you know it's it's yeah. like the beginning of summer and uh you know, and it's May too for a weekend and it's not as big here for um, Victoria Day as it is in Ontario, where it was the one time out of the year that we, or actually two times out of the year that we could actually fire fireworks. Yeah. And it was always a big thing. And it was a stat holiday where we can actually do, whereas here it's sort of like not really a, a, a stat holiday and even more, um, I guess, cut down because of uh, the restrictions that we're having here in Halifax. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, we're we're very restricted here as well. I remember growing up in Newfoundland, you know, May 24th, the May 2-4 was always when people went camping and you'd hope that you wouldn't get snow. Yes. Um, and this year we're actually probably beating records temperatures. I don't know about you. I know in St. John's Absolutely. yesterday I was talking to my friends and it was like sunny in 23 or something. Yeah. Um, here it is what, uh, it was 33, I think yesterday. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. With humidity, you <laughs> with know, humidity, it's, it's like, oh. I know it's like, it's like stupid degrees Celsius or something. I don't know. But, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a weird time because it is the beginning of summer and the beginning of summer is usually when you look forward to jazz festivals, right. Yes. As you just said, and, and performances and our Christmas, you know, you know it's like <laughs> it, it is, it's true. It's jazz Christmas. Season. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean. We're getting through it. I guess the same way you are, just you know, in, in varying degrees and varying states and doing what we can to get through. And you're keeping an entertaining audiences through and through throughout the pandemic. And thank you so very, very much for doing that. And I've listened to you from day one. So mm -hmm. I'll start with this. Um, you know, coming from Newfoundland and then your history, you know, with uh, the Toronto uh, music education system, as well as uh, coming into a longtime broadcaster of jazz music since the mid 1960s with uh, CJRT and Jazz FM 91. Tell me what, how it must have been very daunting to you, you know, coming from not only a jazz vocalist background, but then to host um, a show and then, you know, a morning show for that matter and waking Toronto up in that way with uh, your wonderful humor. But how was it, um, you know, in those early days of hosting the, 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 the show? The, uh, the original, I mean, the original 
Certainly it was challenging just because of the hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes. Um, it's, it's, I took my hat you, off of you, both you and James B. I took the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Well, it was funny because I think sometimes you, you, your focus goes in that direction. So I think my yeah. focus at the time was on radio and I did yeah. some shows, but I didn't do a lot and I didn't record during that time. Um, and it just became about doing the radio show. I loved doing it because, um, it's, it's, it's just a different way to connect to the community. And yeah. I loved being able to, and I still love being able to play music. I mean, you know it, you know what it's all about, being music of, of your friends, of your colleagues, of the people you respect, um, of the up and coming people that you'd love people to know about. So that I, I enjoyed and that I- Did it give you a different perspective of how music was? Uh, you know, you had been performing it all this time, but I found as just, you know, when I got into doing the radio was to be able to have the back end, the history and the intentions and the appreciation for the music rather than just, you know, singing the notes off the page. Absolutely. And I think it's, it was great training for me as a performer, because when you're as, you know, as a, as a host, as a broadcaster, you want to contextualize the music. You want to be able to talk about the composers, the history behind the songs or the artists or whatever the case may be. That was great fodder for me on stage because, you know, I could talk about a particular show that launched a particular career or a particular song. And then if I ended up performing that song, whether my stage was, you know, the radio station or a physical performance stage, I could still talk about the music and, and put it in a different kind of context. So that was great for me. But yes, I definitely, uh, I saw more of the music. I heard more of the music. I became more familiar with artists than maybe I would have done if I hadn't been, um, you know, uh, listening to the records that were getting sent in all the time and doing all of that. So that was, that was kind of cool, getting to know those artists in that way. And, and same thing with jazzology, which I absolutely adore. And you, you, you do it in, in a way in which uh, it just brings up, you can hear the happiness of, of all of the artists and, and, and all that. But coming from a, a jazz educator side of things, mm -hmm. how, how is it when you're interviewing these up and coming artists and then seeing them blossom, you know, on the air and the, in their career, you know, just on that yeah. cusp? It is pretty amazing, I have to say, because so many of them, which it's interesting, we're working on a project right now that I don't want to give away just no. yet, but uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of helping to produce something from the station that actually uh, highlights some of the artists that have gone through jazzology over the years. I took over, I think, because Brad Barker was the host before me, Larry Green, the late, the great, late. wonderful yeah, recently. Lorenzo right. Vincenza. <laughs> no, right? Lorenzo Verdi. Lorenzo Verdi, <laughs> yes. yes. I love that man. Um, so Larry launched the show, Brad took it over, then I took over yes. in 2014. Um, and as I looked over the years, going back to say 2006, 2007, which was the ar archives to which I had um, access, my gosh, you look at some of the names that have gone through and where they've gone, you know, Sienna Dolan, Juno nominee, um, uh, Ewan Farncombe, who's now killing it, um, Sarah Thauer, who I interviewed not too long ago, and she's, you know, she's posting things on social media, sitting in with the, uh, the Seth Meyers band. Oh, um, yes. Right? Uh, and then, and then there's the Chris Butchers and, and guys like that who are now down, you know, Chris is down in, in New Orleans, killing it and playing in, um, I think he's playing with Del Delfeo Marsalis's band. Oh and, yes. Yeah. You know, so it's, it is really, um, it's lovely being able to say that we, um, could talk about these, these, uh, these students, but more importantly, allow these students to talk about themselves and talk about their music, their influences, their training, what inspired them, what motivated them. And now we can play their music as, mm -hmm you know, actual recording artists and talk about their careers. And it's kind of fun. And as someone who, I mean, you know what it's like. We, yeah, we may not be 27 anymore, but we feel like we are. <laughs> yes, so yes. I feel like I just got out of U of T, you know, and really I, I graduated, <laughs> oh my goodness, uh, it would have been 20 odd years ago. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like I can talk to them as someone who, to me, recently went through it, not so recently, I guess, in, in, in the grand scheme of things. but And compare, right? Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. we can talk about, oh, yeah, well, when I was there, it was like this. What about you guys? What do you do now? And um, I feel or like- Or did I you have that instructor? <laughs> you know, or do I could do my best Kirk McDonald impression That's right. or something, you know? So, yeah, it's, it's I feel like it's, um, it's, it's nice to be able to, to connect with that world that I have had such a connection with. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, 
uh, this gentleman who you and I both admire so very much and a fellow clarinetist will be turning the grand old 98 years old, mm. Mr. Order of Canada himself, Phil Nimmons, yeah. uh, the Dean of Canadian Jazz, um, is, uh, is celebrating a birthday next week. How incredible is that? And he is astounding. You know, uh, the 46th anniversary, because I know of this, of uh, the uh, uh, the Atlantic Suite, oh, yeah. uh, which is a classic recording. Um, tell me uh, you know, what his influence and his involvement was in, in your life uh, and how he uh, um, he contributed to Heather Banbrick. Oh, a tremendous amount. He was he was the first professor, he and Paul Reed, I auditioned for them. Yeah. So I was accepted to U of T. And then when you get into the program, you have to do a placement audition. And I was so green. I was so green, Charles. I didn't know, you know, what was going on, what was the right protocol. So I walked into my placement audition with Phil and Paul and I called him and I had just come from a degree in political science and English. So mm -hmm. I was used to calling them Dr. So-and-so and Professor So-and-so. So I walked in and I said, um, hi, Professor Nimitz. And he said, oh God, call me Phil. And I said, okay. All right, Do you have Phil. any good reads? That you, <laughs> you know? So, so uh, he sat and, you know, said, okay, we're just going to see, we just want to hear you sing and see where we can place you with different ensembles. And Paul Reed was playing the piano. And I gave them um, the uh, changes to the blues because I was doing it in the, whatever key. I don't remember even what tune it was. It might've been like straight note chaser. And I wasn't doing it in the standard key. So I handed him the change. I, I'm not sure if you know it in this key. It's the blues. And they're Phil <laughs> Nimmons and Paul Reed. Uh, Phil was um he was just one of these guys that was a, a bottomless wealth of knowledge i mean just you know the pool of knowledge that he had was deep and murky at times hmm. and clear at other times and sometimes you wanted to d dive in further and find out what he was talking about and pick his brain and he was always willing to have his brain picked he i remember i would walk into school you know whatever, 8, 15, 8, 30 in the morning. And Phil would already be up in his office rehearsing. He'd practice yeah. You could hear the, the, the strains coming out of the window. Um, he would do things. I actually met Phil initially at jazz camp before I went to U of T. I, wow. I flew up to Toronto earlier and I went to a camp that he and, and Paul ran. And every day he would gather all the campers, all the instrumentalists, all the vocalists all together. And uh, we would all sit in a barn and he would do, um, it was almost like a philosophy. Uh, kind of a class and he would talk about various things and I remember one day he played this nature tapes you know you hear the whales yeah, and the yeah. waves and all that and we kind of sat there listening for whatever 10 15 20 minutes and kind of looking at each other wondering what this was all about and then at the end of it he stopped it and he said okay what what time signature were the waves in hmm. and we went what and he said and that that bird call that loon you know, how many, uh, what was the interval the loon called in? And just getting us to, you know, what key was that bird singing in? And his whole point was, there is music everywhere. Hmm. You got to be open to it. You've got to have your ears open. And that's where you're going to find your inspiration and your motivation. And that's where you're going to really be able to um, allow yourself as an artist to remain open to all things sound and sonic and musical. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that Phil would would teach us. And the, the other thing that he always used to do, he would give you a loony for different things. So, and it, and it wasn't like you did well on your test, here's your loony. It was, you know, if you were going through something, he'd all of a sudden just come up very quietly and hand you a loony. And I still have my loony from him. Oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> and he had nicknames for everybody, you know? Oh. Um, I was Barley Greens. I don't know why I was <laughs> Barley Greens, but I think I, because we started talking about taking, drinking Screech. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, you know what, the screech will keep you keep you going a long time. And he said, but barley greens will too. I said, okay, I'm going to try my barley greens. I think it was something like that. And then it was always barley greens. Barley greens. <laughs> so he was, but he was so, you know, endearing. And then recently, thank goodness, I was so, I'm so fortunate because uh, Holly, his daughter, I got, yeah. I've got to know, I mean, I got to know Noreen, who was so wonderful. Yeah. She came on, you know, if we had performances, I know I mean, we went to IAJE in Atlanta and Noreen was there and she was like all of our moms. No. You know, if you needed anything, you went to Noreen and she she was so smart and so kind and so funny. And you you really saw what they loved about each other. And I got to know Spencer and Holly, his kids. And every year for the last say, well, not the last couple, because he's it's, we've been doing this, you know, in the pandemic. But um, prior to that, um, there was a luncheon that they would have and three students. I, I don't know how it happened, but but uh, David Braid, 
And Anthony McKelly and and I were we were always invited to his luncheon for his birthday. Oh, that's great! So, and he was so Charles. He was so with it. I mean, everything. Yes. You know, whatever was going on, whether he was eighty nine or ninety or ninety two, yeah. he was. You know, what's happening with that now? And he he would remember <laughs> everything. Yeah. You know. Yeah. He's just and really really quickly because I know I'm, I'm rambling on, but I can no. talk about Phil all the time. Of course. Um, when I was in my fourth year at U of T, I was singing with James B with the Beehive Singers and the Royal Jelly Orchestra, and we were uh, invited to go on tour, a uh, cross-Canada tour. Well, it wasn't cross-Canada. We didn't go any further east than Montreal. Um, but uh, we, uh, I know, as an East Coast, <laughs> yeah, I know, it's Canada, terrible. I, my, I was like, what are you doing? Say, yeah, you my mother East... would be, Heather, it's not cross Canada. Um, <laughs> East Coast audience here, Heather, you know, we're I know, not in Toronto anymore. I know, it's, <laughs> they, but that's the funny, that's what they were called. We're going across Canada. I go, no, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> not across Canada. Um, but, but we had to get off a couple of classes, you know, yeah. a couple of weeks of classes. And, uh, and all four of us went to speak <clears> with Phil, uh, Phil and Paul. And I remember we thought Phil would just, you know, he's, he's toured. He's a musician. He's worked his whole life. He'll get this. And he said, I don't think you should do this. And we said, well, why? He said, you made a commitment to your fellow students. This is a band now. You're in a band with these guys. So you have, you know, your, your vocal jazz ensemble, the big bands you're singing with, your small quartet or quintet or whatever it was at the time. And he said, now you're letting them down. You're not going to be there for performances. Wow. The I was like, wow. Ooh. And he said, it's a commitment that you make. I, I know you think it's just school, but this is what the world is. And when you join a band going forward, and because he led a band, a big band for such a long time. Yes. He said, I want you to talk to your bandmates and see how they feel. And I went, mm. wow. Mm. He said, if they're okay with it, I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. so, so we did. We went to you know all the ensembles and everybody was okay. But <laughs> that was a big lesson from Phil. Wow. That, and I, I just thought he'd just say, yes, it's a life experience. Go for it. Yeah. But he taught us he, every day. There was a new lesson from him. Wow. It's yeah. just uh, it, no wonder, you know, and this is the thing that you can just talk about him for hours of the, the amount of influence and mentorship and, and everything that has shaped you, Heather Van Brick, uh, throughout your, your career. Absolutely. Speaking of which, uh, mm -hmm. your album, uh, Fine State, which is a fine album in yeah. itself, uh, it, it has such an eclectic uh, selection of uh, music, both the Great American Songbook and then also picking some chestnuts like uh, Walk Between Ra the Raindrops, you know, by, yeah. uh, you know, Donald Fagan. Uh, tell me, you know, um, your albums uh, that you, uh, you select and the selections that you have, what, what, uh, what gives you sort of the inspiration to, uh, to be able to select the, the, the pieces that you have? Because they have been done so many times yeah. They are standards. They are yeah. part of the great American songbook vernacular for all jazz musicians. And how is it that to this very day, even rock musicians that were very popular in the, in the 1960s and 70s are now uh, reverting to these uh, standards. What is it about the great American songbook that, uh, that keeps it going and, um, and keeps it and, and is timeless, I guess? And throughout this this uh, this whole era of music, yeah. well, you know, we always say they don't make them like that anymore. They mm. don't write them like that anymore. You know, uh, we're composers. We're composers. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I mean, they had yeah. to. You know, so much of it also came from shows, came from the Broadway stages and whatnot, and movie musicals. So they had to really tell a story. Um, it wasn't just you know, fourteen people getting together with a sampling machine and you know a computer and over overdubbing some noises or whatever the case may be. It was really about telling a story. Um, I I don't want to say intricate harmony because that scares people off, you know. But it was it's it, the the chords to me the beautiful thing. My dad taught me about this. You know, my dad was a big chord guy. He was a saxophone player, but he was all about harmony and he was all about chords. And, and I think that's what I got from him was just this feeling of, of absolute emotional movement based on just the sound of notes together. In a Without even hearing the lyrics. Don't even need them. Don't even start. You don't even have to start with that. And yes. No. Yeah. And, and people have asked me so many times, you know, mm -hmm. uh, didn't you hear the lyrics? I said, no, I'm oh. hearing actually the, 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 the harmony of yeah. instrumentals because that's where I have, you know, sometimes when I'm listening to a piece of music, I can't even comprehend the lyrics because I'm, I'm listening so hard to the music. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, so you start there, you start with just that foundation of this, 
this beautiful harmony. And then there are these these gorgeous melodies that, you know, that that grow in, in, and they have such range and sometimes complexity and sometimes simplicity, you know, with the rhythms and, you know, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Do what, do what, do what, do what? Really, it's one note. Yes. But it's 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 the rhythm it's that play that happens with the beat and the groove and the accent and all that so so then you add the melody then you know i mean uh, uh, the lyrics are unlike anything that we hear these days johnny mercer and oh. gershwin's and you know like on yeah. and on and on berlin you just keep and, going. Yeah. And, even and it's the, you know, poetry. It really is. And, 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 and then when you get behind the stories behind them, behind these music, these musicians, these composers, these lyricists, um, you know, you learn to me, I've, I, one of the beautiful things that I learned, you know, over the last few years is just really looking at the difference between someone like a, a Lorenz Hart and an Oscar Hammerstein, who both worked with Richard Rogers, had prolific careers with Richard Rogers the difference in style Def and the yeah. tone of their lyric, you yeah. know? Because uh, he was a very, very, Rogers was a very different composer for each respective. Absolutely. And, and it, makes, it makes me as a singer sing the songs differently. You know, it, when, when you know maybe the background of, of Lorenz Hart's story as a, you know, a, a diminutive, closeted, gay Jewish man mm. writing something like My Funny Valentine, Yes. <laughs> Which has been done time and time and time and time again. But then when yes. you know the backstory, you, you think of the song differently. You sing it differently. Absolutely. So I think that just it's the it's the the range of material, the range of emotional connection that you are able to really feel. It's palpable. And it starts right from harmony, goes through melody, goes through lyric, then arrangement instrumentation i mean you know look at look at that the the orchestral Joni mitchell record to both sides now from oh. 2000 you know or or gorgeous um, you know I, I mean there's songs we know yes but it's those arrangements it's those, those interpretations things. of those are you know yeah and you know and this is i think one of the big things of why the long-lasting power of sinatra versus crosby is, is yeah. that Crosby put saying anything that was put in front of him and really didn't give, you know, too much effort on what, how his backings were, whether right. it was a quartet or whether it was orchestral. Sinatra chose those arrangements and made sure that it was intricately because whenever you think I've got you under my skin, you think da 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 or or uh, fly me to the moon yeah you know? go 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 yeah totally. no and it's just yeah uh it's so synonymous with the 20th century vernacular of american popular music that you can't not identify that song within the first few seconds rather than the few, you know, first few stanzas of of, yeah. of the song before. Oh, okay, that's the song. Yeah, exactly. And then you can go on from there, and see how it's developed over the decades. You know, and and throughout. We, it's funny you you mentioned that because, uh, just this week I looked at how high the moon. Oh. Um, we we did this thing on, on this the show every morning at eight thirty Toronto time um, or Eastern time. They do a God. I see. I'm turning into a yeah, Toronto. Yeah, yeah. You're Everybody, a upper Canadian. You upper Canadian. They're new. Damn it! <laughs> break, my, break myself out of that, my son. Right fast. <laughs> yes. Um, but we do a thing. It's called Song of the Day, and it could be about anything. But what I like to do sometimes is do something called not take five, but five takes. So yes. five different takes of the same tune. And this week I did uh, How High the Moon. And of course you start with Ella. Course, because that's of course, what we because that, uh, you know, LM Berlin, right? 45 songs quoted, yes, in scat, right? And and it's and it's as you say, it's become synonymous with her. Um, but then you know, Manhattan Transfer, Sarah Vaughn, you know, the, the the vocalist like that, but then Marvin Gaye recorded, yes, in what 60, 61, 62, 52, yeah. Yeah, uh, his first recording for Motown was all standards, and he did How High the Moon. And, and very few people know that, right? Yeah. 
And then Keely Smith recorded it as a ballad. Oh, yes. Uh, I think, gosh, it was it was Keely swings sings bassy style with strings. I think that was the album she did it on in two thousand um, ninety nine. I think or two thousand. Yeah, yeah. 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 Some, somewhere around there, exactly. And and but she does it as a ballad. Yes. You know, so all that to say, even though the songs are synonymous with certain artists, the arrangements can go in so many different directions, and that's the power of a good song. That's and why a, those yeah. songs lend themselves to these you know, extrapolations and, and, and developments and whatnot, because they are so strong. It's, it's like anything. You've got good bones in a house. Yeah. You can take down a wall here and there and pull up the carpet and put down the, you know, whatever, because the structure is so good. The bones are so good. And that's what my mantra is on my, my radio shows is that, you know, you can write a, a bunch of chords and lyrics that can have the cheap way out of actually uh, garnering emotion. But these artists are restricted to those notes and lyrics, and it's their interpretation that's communicating to the audience mm -hmm. that you uh, that they, that's where the artistry is. Yeah, yeah. Time yeah. and time, decade after decade, a new century, yeah. you know, over time. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and how lucky are we to be living in this world where we get to We're, listen to this? And I mean, the amount of money, I was looking at my CD collection, this binder cost me $5,000 in CDs back when I, when Sam Snyderman would open the door for me on Young Street there yeah. in the morning because I was the first little boy, 11 years old, coming into CJRT, mind you, um, as a, as a boy it. volunteering for the funding drive. And yeah. I bought my records before I got onto the Mutual Street Studios there and eventually onto Gould where I went for radio and TV there. But it's I just an uh, um, it, it, amount of history. Um, I wanted to talk because I, I talked to many vocalists about this uh, and, and also um, uh, musicians, um, instrumental musicians, but the difference between studio and live recording. Mm. Tell me your uh, experiences and, and what you get out of uh, each yeah. respective uh, medium. I'm, as you said, you know, in the, in the intro, which was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I love entertaining. I love, uh, to me, the audience is the next, is the other bandmate, you know? So I love being with my, my, my guys. Uh, and I say my guys, cause you know, even if when I, when I play with the gals, they're still the guys. Um, so I love playing with, with my bandmates, but the audience becomes that other bandmate um, where we can riff and we can laugh at each other. And, and to me, a live show is really just all about, okay, what's the audience going to be like? Cause that's going to dictate the show. You know, the, the caliber of musicians I get to play with, they're just, they're always solid, you know, hopefully I'm always in good voice and, and, and in good imagination, you know, musical ideas and whatnot. It's the audience that really dictates what the show is going to be. So there's a beautiful spontaneity and a uniqueness to every show that I enjoy. And I love that. Um, I have, I have not yet done a live record myself. I would like to one day when we ever get out there again. Um, <laughs> but I would like to, I think I will be, I would be very picky about, you know, oh God, I didn't like the way I sang that. My experience with live was with Broadway with, um, Diane Leah and Julie Michaels. We have a jazz cabaret act that we do. Um, and we made a, a Christmas album a few years back and we recorded some live tracks that we had done at uh, jazz bistro when we did our shows there. Um, and it is funny how you listen to stuff and you go, oh God, okay, that night two wasn't as strong as night three. So let's listen to night three now. And, you know, you get very picky because yeah. in the studio, it's very sterile. Uh, I, I'm getting more, I'm, I'm falling a little more in love with recording in a studio. At the beginning, I hated it. It's painstaking, um, isn't it? It is. It is. And and I guess you, you we put so much on ourselves because we know this is captured for eternity on a stage it's a moment and then it's gone. Although with iPhones and everything now it's different, you know, but yes. smartphones, I should say, but yeah. So I'm, I'm getting to like or love um, the recording process a little bit more. And I guess the more you get used to your surroundings, the more you find a studio that you feel comfortable in uh, an engineer with whom you enjoy working uh, you know, a, a vibe that you're, you're feeling like, okay, I, I'm in my groove here. Then the studio becomes a little but more enjoyable. How much but post I, is, is, is being done on, on the recording process nowadays? I, I don't, I'm a little out of touch because I haven't yeah. been in the recording studio for so, uh, for so long, but mm -hmm. how much post uh, and, and how much dependency on post is done? And is that economics or is that just because of the fact that we have such an explosion? Because back in the fifties and sixties, it's you rehearse, 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 yeah. rehearse, set up three microphones, set up the tra 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 track tape and you record live with the band. 
yeah. that, that that's economically unfeasible now. Just like Carol yeah. Burnett having a 40 piece orchestra on prime time live. Right. It's, it's unfeasible now because yeah. we cannot do it in an economical structure like this. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it's about practicality. For me, I, I never, I mean, I will always sing a vocal as if it's gonna go on the record, but when the bed tracks, so the bed tracks are the instrumental tracks, yeah. um, when, which you know, but if, if someone watching or listening doesn't know the bed tracks, we refer to those as the instrumental tracks. When we're recording beds, I will always, I'll sing a ghost vocal, but I'll always sing it as if maybe it'll make it. But I have found over the years that recording with my good pal, John O'Grant, who was really the first person to really record my voice in a way that I really liked it. That's where my, my preferred studio is to record vocals. So yeah, our, our process is get in, get beds done in a studio that you know has the space, has obviously the, the gear, you can get the engineer you want, all that sort of, th sort of thing. Uh, so that's first thing, get solos in overdubbed because of course you might have a great track that everybody loves, but then all of a sudden, you know, whoever's blown the solo says, yeah, I didn't like that solo. So now the track, you, it's it's harder to cut in because it's so it's not like a, a, a maybe a, a pop tune where everything is consistent everything always changes with every new take so you'll do beds you overdub solos and then i will then overdub vocals later so it actually it is separated adds, yeah yeah it's separated it adds to the expense truthfully because you go into two different studios you know two different engineers two different producers blah 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 but um to me in terms of the overall product, that's the way I prefer to do it. That's, I find a lot of people are doing it that way. You get so, like Alex Pangman recently did a record where they did everything live off the floor and and she's but she's very much rooted in that, she that is. more traditional, for lack of a better term, sound and vibe. And that sounds beautiful for her. You know, mm, she sounds yeah. so good in that format. So I guess to a certain extent, there's a fair bit done. And then you'll get, you know, um, you know, a group like, like Dawn Bright Up and Monkey House, where I, I, you know, did some things not with Dawn and Mike, Monkey House, but with the Bright Up Brothers. So you see that process, which is even more involved because there are more people involved, but there's the production. It's a little more of a production, you know, and, and um, a little more work goes into it. So I think there's, there's a little more work done in post, but there's still, there's not as much as certainly in pop music you know, yeah. or, or rock or contemporary in that way, because there's an integrity of the spontaneity uh, that comes at a given moment in jazz. <laughs> it reminds yeah. me of the story that Pizzarelli was uh, talking about where he was right across uh, 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 the hall from, oh, I forget which musician it was now, mm -hmm. but he, um, it was September 11th and he, he was, it, it, um, and he was uh, recording and it was, um, oh, uh, anyways, he was he was saying, you know, he recorded his whole album in three days and they were like on their nine month in recording. <laughs> <laughs> right? The difference between jazz and, 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 and pop, you know, so. <laughs> I mean, you look at, and even the guys who are, cross, you know, the Steely Dan guys who yeah. we mentioned. Oh, like yes. Reagan. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they, they'll cross over jazz and pop, but the. Oh, you know, the amount of work on, uh, you know, you've seen that VH1 documentary on Asia yeah. and you see yeah. just how much right down to that one cowbell <laughs> no. yeah and i think for for jazz musicians it's more about um yeah capturing that that spontaneity that the, the the magic that comes in a particular moment on the floor that if you if you overproduce it doesn't it sounds overproduced i mean that's like personally you know this is just for me i love diana crawl's early stuff because I get that sense that it's not as produced. Tommy LaPuma was brilliant. There's yes. no two ways about that. Yes. I love that early stuff. Before there was too much, where it was just her and I think, you know, John Clayton and, and was it John Clayton and Jeff Hamilton? Jeff Hamilton, yes, that's right. And that first, yeah. you know, the Klaus first, Ogerman. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The first record was just so uh, raw. Pure. Maybe? I don't Pure. know. Thank yeah. you. Better way of putting it. Pure. Yeah. So there's there's that vibe. that organic feel that uh, that is yeah. not just overproduced, right? Yeah, and and certain vocal records that I love, where um, you know, you, New York Voices, for example, did uh, a record a tribute to Paul Simon. I think it was the only release they ever did on RCA, and it wasn't overly, you know, the you, the vocals weren't all tuned perfectly. They weren't out of tune. No way. They're still <laughs> so solid. But as you say, there's that organic purity 
of the voice of the instrument that comes through that makes those chords ring in a particular way that isn't they're not so homogenous mm. you know they're not overly produced to the point where it sounds like okay and like you know i love jacob collier but there's a sound that jacob collier has because yes. there's so much overdubbing of his voice and there's a, a, a homogenous sound that he achieves that you don't hear in some of the new york voices stuff and things like that ella and lewis yes you know the the the, 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 the back and forth yeah, of yes. those two voices where she had such a beautiful light pure sound and he was that, you know? yeah <laughs> but it works it's the it's the oil it and water thing that they don't come together they they mingle and it's a beautiful thing and yet consequently it's very very hard for these overproduced albums to be presented live and in a club yes. you know with or or concert stage without yeah. it being itself in a produced setting and yeah. so very very hard to uh, to sort of achieve and get that purity yeah and it's interesting because I, I had a chance to chat with melody gardo a couple of weeks mm. ago because she's got the new release yes um and it's and it's done beautifully with full orchestra I've recorded at abbey road studios but she's then, always in your face, isn't she? When yeah. she when she sings, right? Right yes. up to that microphone. This, you you a, can hear you, every breath, you know. A gorgeous intimacy and yeah. and, and, a, and a a lack of any kind of uh, self consciousness. It sounds like you know she's just there with yeah. no apologies, and I love that. But but three, I think well, maybe five tunes on the record they did acoustically. So they didn't do any strings. It was just, I think, uh, Vinnie Cayuta was on it. Um, I'm trying to think of who else played on it. I'm drawing a blank right now. But hmm. uh, I asked, because they released the deluxe edition, I said, so why did you decide to do it this way? And, and she's talked about this idea of taking away this this out uh, the the layers of paint from a painting and just stripping it down to the purity of the image Streisand did that. Um, and uh, Bill Evans did that from left Absolutely. to right. Um, and she did that earlier on with uh, uh, "Star." If the stars are mine, uh, in that in that album, that debut album, she did two, the deluxe version and the and the yeah. and the and the and the regular organic version or whatever. And it, it's it, it was an interesting concept the way yes. she explained it, where you know you don't get all the layering, mm. you just get down to the nitty gritty of what the song is, and you you hear the purity of the tune, the core. Yeah, that's it. You know, and I wow. think that's as you say. You know, it's 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 about maintaining that that integrity. Oh my God, Heather, I could talk to you for hours. I know. <laughs> Let's do this every week. It's like peeling a it's like peeling an onion. I, you know, I hear it's like and it, it's like it, it, and all my dreams have come true to to be able to to, to discuss with you this. But uh, well, um, you know what it is because we we get a chance to geek out over this stuff. That's right. Yes. You know, you don't always get a chance to talk to people about this. It's really no. nice to have someone who's, you know, got that 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 shared mindset and shared love of this stuff. And we can just go and remember. And what about? <laughs> yeah. Fun. Well, that I, that I wanted to ask you that. How did you get into this whole nostalgia, pop culture? And, and I think you're, you're a lexicon for for information when you and Brad, when Brad is uh, quizzing you <laughs> and, and stuff, it you you pull it out, and I'm going, wow! And I'm, I'm not, and I'm not yelling on the radio, going, Heather, this is the answer. You get yeah. it right on the. Mark. Oh, you could. There, there are times you're. Probably, <laughs> I know you probably are. There are definitely a few times. I remember. I don't know if you heard the one where Brad was giving me something. He was. He was. I don't remember what it was, but I remember the, the answer was Keith Jarrett. And yeah. The name Keith Jarrett could not come into my mind. It was, but I, but I could hear him. But it's the pressure. It's him. like watching Jeopardy, though. Okay, yeah. it's so much easier at home than it is I up know. there. On the, on the I know. <laughs> and all I could do when I was trying to guess Keith Jarrett without without remembering his name was I started to say, eh, he's the guy that plays Sony and Souls. He does this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is that? Um, how did I get into it? Um, I, my dad. Yeah. You know, dad listened to to jazz. He he but he but he also listened to not a lot of jazz, but jazz and then moved into jazz funk. Um, he started listening to jazz when he was a young man and he used to talk to me about it. And one of my favorite stories is, is you know, when I first came home from U of T, my first uh, Christmas um, uh, in my first year there, and I brought home a bunch of CDs and my dad and I stayed up literally till seven o'clock in the morning all night uh, drinking beer and listening to, to music and talking about life. And so I was playing a Thelonious Monk record CD and dad, what was what's that? I said, that's, that's a monk. That's monk. I said, yeah, that's monk. Jesus, that's great. I, I could never get Monk listening to Monk growing up. I, I could, he was always too out there for me. Mm. Um, and, and so 
then we started talking about, you know, dad talked about Monk and he talked about Miles and he talked about then, you know, Della Reese and dove mm. into that and Matthew G. And then he went back to the Billy Butterfields and the Jonah Joneses and the, the old guys. And, um, and then the more I got into it, the more dad and I listened to more music. And then, and, but he also listened to Chicago and Average White Band and, yeah. you know, all those great kind of jazz funk with, with the horns and yeah, yeah oh man he was you know hmm. he loved he loved tower of power all that stuff oh. with the horns you know yeah. so that was really it was my dad that first had me listening to it and that was really how we were able to bond musically after that and my dad was also very he was he was a government uh, employee he worked with um uh, workers compensation for years but he was an, a, a ridiculously great musician as well he just never studied it um but I remember one time he was booked to do a gig um, with some studied musicians. He said, he plays by ear, played by ear. And he said, you know, I, I, they're going to ask me what key I play in and I'll <laughs> play whatever key they're in. You know, yeah. and so he said, I need to know what key I do these songs in. That was when I realized my dad was so lodged, or logged in into, um, or locked, I should say, into a particular tonal center when he got there. So, for example, you know, we picked a tune, whatever, Fly Me to the Moon, and, and he played mm -hmm. in one key, and then we'd play the next tune, and he'd play the in the same key. That's F. And then he'd yeah. play the next tune. That's F. I mean, he's like, how come I'm always in F? <laughs> I said, because that's where you're playing it. Yeah. So then we, anyway, we took Ipanema, Girl from Ipanema, and we went, to, and the bridge moves. You yes. know, I mean, that moves quite, quite, you know, it jumps. <laughs> it's like, if you don't understand music, it's basically the bridge moves from house to house to house to house all right. the time. And right. you have to get used to the new house. And then as soon as you get used to the new house, it, it goes to another house. Tonight, yeah. It didn't matter what key I, so I, dad and I were on speakerphone and I was at my little keyboard in my basement and every key I played it in, dad just hit it. And I, I said to him, I said, what are you thinking about? Like, are you thinking, oh, okay, now now she's in F. Now, oh, now she's in A flat. He's, I'm, I'm thinking about how to play the right notes. <laughs> I said, so you're not thinking about key signature or, or now we're in four flats or anything. No, I'm, I'm thinking about play the melody properly. So that's, I think I got it all from my dad, you know? And then, Natural sense. Yeah. Sense. I mean, I'm yeah. so lucky to have gotten that that musicianship from him because he was blessed with it. And he passed it on to me and I, uh, I wouldn't be doing this without him. So I think it all started from him. And then my teachers over the years, you know, back in Newfoundland, um, Karen, Karen Oakley was my very first music teacher. She was incredible. And she lit a spark, a, a love of singing in me that has never gone away. Susan Quinn, an amazing choral conductor, director, musician herself. Um, uh, Valerie Long, who first had me scat for the very first time. Wow. Go, scat! I was like, what? <laughs> Okay. okay. Um, and then Jacinta, Jacinta Graham, Jacinta Mackie Graham, who um, was really the first person who said, you should pursue this. Right. So it, and then of course my teachers here, you know, yeah. Bill and Paul and Carol Wellsman and, and Mike Murley and Chase Sanborn and Brian Dickinson and Alex Dean and Kirk McDonald. And I mean, my everyone, God. everyone, the people I've been lucky to study with over yeah. the years. And every time I do a gig with these guys, the guys I play with now, it's still always a lesson, a, le a learning day. lesson. Always, Wonderful. Always, always. Well, I thought, I think that we can conclude because, uh, with, with a little quiz, I'm going to give you, <laughs> oh, Heather. No. Oh, no. <laughs> this is because the this, Jeopardy thing again. No, no, that's okay. It's all right. Because this is a very, <laughs> very, very symbolic day. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought I might do this because of a, of a subject that I'm, I'm absolutely, um, also obsessed with and uh, i know that you have a little background on this so we'll we'll, we'll, we'll do this okay and okay. it won't be too hard okay okay <laughs> as long as there's so, no map i'm good it's it's may 22nd today yes yeah so may 22nd 1992 29 years ago was a monumental date in television history what was it 1992 may mm. 22nd 1992 it was before i moved to toronto mm-hmm Trying to think of what was going on then. <laughs> it was a huge. Okay, it was. A, okay. I'll I'll give you I'll give you a couple more clues. It was okay. a huge mass exodus of of uh, of shows uh, that uh, were, were leaving. The Golden Girls, Cheers, and another program that left in ninety two and was on the same network. So yeah, so that okay, so that was NBC. Uh, I I would have said Cheers. That was the day. The, the, yes, when... and uh, and actually the, the two had in, in, in common. All right, I'll 
and and I'll give I'll give this one now away. Now you've got me they, intrigued. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it had had it had to do with somebody who was also finishing after twenty nine years. That's not that wasn't Carson. It was it was Carson on this me? day on this day twenty nine years ago, and it was funding drive for CGRT, and I was. I was uh, wow. young and I was saying, oh my gosh, it's the end of an era. I, I you know, right? I balled the, the, the previous night and it was a Saturday morning because it mm. was uh, still doing the, the jazz scene uh, Saturday morning uh, right. funding drive. Mm. And uh, it was all on the front pages. I mean, the Soviet Union's ending did not get as much publicity as Carson's <laughs> ending at that time. And that was, was, was it Bette, Bette, Bette Midler? Ah, that... that was my next question. On oh, the second to last yeah. night, Johnny Carson had two guests, one of which was the great uh, Robin Williamson. Who was the other? Bette Midler. And didn't she, did she sing one for my baby? That one was one my third question. Very good. <laughs> okay, I redeemed she, myself. You get the, you get the, you, you have <laughs> redeemed yourself. That's right. She sang yeah. Har Harold Allen, Johnny Mercer's One for My Baby, One More for the Road. She sang two yeah. other songs. You made me love you, and also here's that rainy day, which was Carson's favorite song. Oh, uh, and I what have an chills, emotional Charles! I've got chills now. And the, the, and so it's so symbolic that you uh, that we decided that we would uh, we would have a talk on, on on this particular day because it is a a, a huge thing because I I did uh, my final paper in RTA um, in, at Ryerson on late night talk shows and um, and wow. Carson. And now there's a new series on CNN, which is the story of late night, which is excellent. I was just going to ask you. I haven't seen it yet. I've, I've been taping it. I haven't watched Tape it, it. Yet. Okay. Uh, There's a guy by the name of Bill Zamey, who mm -hmm. uh, is the author of, uh, who was the, uh, uh, who did a official biography on, uh, on uh, Johnny Carson and Hugh Hefner right. and Andy Kaufman and mm -hmm. uh, Regis. Uh, and uh, he has been working for the last 25 years on Carson. And I've been uh, researching this with him and, and supplying him with uh, a lot of, of the footage. And so he's yeah. he's been in there. So it's a huge, huge thing, but it, it, it just kind of all, uh, uh, you know, culminates together. And Bette Midler singing that last song was just a, and she, when she recorded it, it was so emotional. And this is why I was bringing this back and we're circling back to the whole live performance thing is, mm. is that there was so much emotion. It was such a beautiful moment that she rec took the audio and put it on her Miss Divine uh, Experience uh, album that, that particular year and it won a Grammy award. Yeah. So there you are. And as you say, right, it's, it's just, there's, a, there's an essence that comes from a live performance that yes. just can't be captured any other way. Yes. Heather Banbrick, thank you so very much for spending some time with me on your, uh, on your weekend. I know you're a very, very busy individual with this multifaceted career that you have. It is an honor and a pleasure. I hope to see you in person again yes, very please. soon. And, um, and, and please keep in touch. It's, it's just Absolutely. such a thrill. And thank you so much for, for, for making another dream come true. And that is to talk Charles, to you. So thank there you, you are. so much. It's, this has been, I love this. I would do this on a regular basis with you any day. <laughs> My you. last gig incidentally, before the pandemic hit was in Nova Scotia. Uh, it was at St. FX. So oh, oh, I got it. Were you there with Marley? I wasn't there with Merle. I did a thing with uh, with Paul Tynan and and you know all the guys there, Paul and Kevin and Tom and uh, just it was it was so I love those oh. guys, Tom oh, and Tom. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was uh, that was my last uh, my last gig before the uh, before everything shut down. So it's it was a nice way to kind of take a break, launching yes. it from Nova Scotia. So I got to get back there soon. So thank you to thanks to you and and Andrew and everybody at um you know the the jazz festival there. It is truly one of the best jazz. I heard your tribute to anywhere. Andrew the other morning too. And so what? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Listen, <laughs> I I loved I loved that show that yeah. I did that night. I love coming to Halifax whenever I get a chance to come down there. I yeah. I. I say down there, and as soon as I say down there, I picture myself going down by the water and yeah. walking along, you know, and seeing all of that stuff down there. And um, welcome it, to my neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> listen, anytime. So as you say, we'll do this again very soon, and we'll get together and we'll we'll geek out over music again in person. And I'm gonna I'm gonna hug the be jumpings out of you. And we'll have a drink. Amen to that. Thank you Thanks, so Charles. much, darling. Okay. Be safe. Take care. See you later. Bye bye Bye. Now.